myself sorted. <laughs> I'm the only one without a handbag. Oh, no, you don't have a handbag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, Jane. <laughs> Welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming today mm -hmm. to what is the second in the conversation series that um, QPAC's hosting around the event that is the visit by the, by the Bolshoi. Um, I was reminded this morning when I was making notes for... This session, uh, I, I remember being in, in Melbourne and saying to my mum, I've, I've, I've got to make this speech, mum, I need a joke, you know, something funny. And she said, darling, you're a professor and no one expects you to be funny. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so all of the jokes will come from this side of the panel today, there won't be any from me. Um, I was thinking this morning it's a great time to live in Queensland, especially for people who love ballet. Um, over recent years, we've enjoyed the Paris Opera, the National Ballet of Cuba, the Hamburg Ballet, and last Thursday night, the Bolshoi opened in Brisbane. The Australian Ballet performs every year, and um, the Queensland Ballet is going through a resurgence with the um, recent appointment of artistic director uh, Lee Shwin Sing. So it's, it feels like a very good time to be here especially for those people who have been involved in dance their whole life. And I think great credit's got to go to QPAC for that. Um, it was John Kotsis who had the vision to have an international series here and, you know, thankfully it was ballet. Um, <laughs> I think that was, a, of course, a perfect choice. And the audiences <laughs> have come. Mm -hmm. um, if, if there are good quality shows, then people, wherever they are, will come. Um, the point of these... The point of this series is really just to have some conversations around ballet. The, the lecture we had on Wednesday was about reading ballet. How do you interpret what happens on the stage and understand it better? And Kristen Bell did that with a little bit of feminist humour and a few wisecracks. <laughs> um, and she made it entertaining, as she did for all those years that she worked at a tertiary institution. And today we're talking about the classics. And I'll get David to talk about what that means um, first up. But... Um, <coughs> what we mean by the classics and why it is that they continue to be so popular and, and draw the largest audiences. To talk to that topic on the classics, we have three fantastic, knowledgeable speakers. And you have a long description about their illustrious careers in your program, so I won't do long introductions. Sharon Bowden um, is an adjunct professor of dance at QUT and was for many years the head of dance at QUT. Sharon's also a choreographer and uh, a designer, and she has been a dance critic for The Australian for uh, over a decade. Yeah. Well over. <laughs> well over a decade. Uh, Natalie Weir is currently the artistic director of Expressions Dance Company, our very own dance company here based in Brisbane. Nat's created over 150 works for companies all over the world, both ballet and contemporary companies, in her 20 year career. We always think of Nat as a young person because Cher and I taught her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and her recent work, uh, Where the Hardies, won both Australian Dance Awards and a Helpman Award, so we're very proud of her for that. David McAllister is, as you know, the Artistic Director of the Australian Ballet Company and a more generous artist you could not find. Uh, David was a dancer with the Australian Ballet for many years and he rose through to the rank and was promoted to Principal Artist in 1989. So I thank all of our speakers for being here. We're going to start off with a general conversation and there'll be time at the end for questions. Can I just ask that people turn off their mobile phones? Um, at the end, when there are questions, um, there will be mics, so uh, we, can, we can all hear what those questions are. But David, if I can start by asking you to just talk <coughs> a little bit about what we mean when we say the classics and what we're talking about when we say classical ballet. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's interesting because we were having a little bit of a chat about this before. I think um, the classics are the works that were done in that period of time, um, I guess in the, you know, the late 1800s. Um, you know, before that, there was the Romantic period, then the Classical period, and then you know, the sort of post-classical um, period. Uh, to me, what classical ballet is, is actually the technique. So um, the technique that began you know, over 300 years ago and that we still teach today is you know constantly evolving, but actually it's the basis of what classical ballet is, is the technique. Um, the classical ballet phenomena um, is a constantly evolving and changing thing. And I guess when you think about the classics, you think about ballets like, um, that's currently playing um, La Corsaire, but you know, um, things like Sleeping Beauty, um, Nutcracker, 
Giselle, which is actually a romantic piece, but you know we always call it classic. Um, but they're the works that you know. There's <coughs> about five or six of them. Capalia, Swan, um, Lake. Swan Lake, of course. How could I forget Swan Lake? Um, <laughs> that they are, you know, the canon of those works that we think of as classical ballets. Um, and we were having a conversation before about, you know, uh, uh, I was saying, I guess, you know, there's still classics being created, and then we had this whole conversation about between the difference between a classic and a masterwork, because a masterwork actually can happen at any time and, and has happened, you know, through the history, and I guess some of those have become classics. Um, but they're still, I mean, you know, there's amazing works of the late 20th century and, and even of, you know, more recently that I consider classics, even though they're not in that genre of classical mm. classics. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, Cher, tell us a bit about <coughs> the characteristics of the classics. Yeah. How do we know we're watching one? <laughs> How do you know you're watching one? <laughs> because somebody's told you. <laughs> uh, no, I think that, that from that period in the, in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s, the, um, without a doubt, they're, they're what we all know as story ballets. There's a story, the stories were known to um, the particular cultures that they came out of. And there are probably about four points that I think would be common to all of the ballets, and that one is that they're full length. So you go and see one of these classics, and you will see a full length work. So you're there for the evening, from the beginning of the evening to the end of the evening. And typically, they're three or four acts. There can be some, some differences with that, within that, depending on how they've been um, brought down through time, but typically three or four acts. Um, we all know the music. The music is, is a, a clear connector between the narrative and the dance. So the, the, the music has been written for the narrative. The narrative expresses um, through the, the ballet and the music equally. So that the, the emotional capacity of the story is embedded in both the, the dance and the music. So that, that music is a really important um, connector. Um, the, the actual narrative is told largely through mime in those early classics. Mm -hmm. It's not actually the vocabulary of the dance that tells us what the story is. It's the, the mime and the gesture that gives us the significant um, uh, development of the story, not the dance itself. Mm -hmm. So there are times, we were, again talking before, saying you, you could remove certain acts from ballets and it wouldn't actually disrupt the narrative. <laughs> what it would disrupt though, however, is the other thing that, that all of those classics are known for is their ability to offer virtuosic display of technique. Mm -hmm. So that was the other reason that they're a well-known vehicle is that that's how we saw the excellent training, the superb performances, and those very special um, performers who, who could move technique and the genre of ballet beyond where it was commonly known at the time. So that virtuosic dancing we saw in those classics. Without that virtuosic dancing, there wouldn't be much in, in many of them at all. So mm. um, that, that's another one of the... the um, Typical things that you will see, yeah. So, David, when when um, when you're programming new seasons for the ballet, I mean, the thing that you constantly hear is that the classics, the story ballets, are far more popular with audiences. Mm. I mean, is that true? To what extent is that true? And and why why are audiences still um, mostly inclined to go to the classics? Well, it's interesting because I think it, is, it continues to and has in the past gone in real waves. Um, obviously, when Petipa was creating his, his repertoire, the classics were, uh, the story ballets were the ballets that people wanted to go and see. And really, there was no such thing as um, abstract or short ballets. Um, that really was a phenomenon that came about with... Um, the Mikhail Fakin, actually, he was the one who actually did the very first abstract ballet, which was La Lace or Fees. Um, and the phenomena of a mixed program was something that really came into prominence and, and um, great, embraced hugely by the public in, with the Ballet Russe in the beginning of the um, 20th century. And really rode a crest. In fact, I mean, the Diaghilev Ballet did The Sleeping Beauty in 1924, I think it was, or 23. 
And it was a disaster. No one, was, people stayed away in droves. They spent a fortune mm. on, they actually had to flee London <coughs> and leave the sets and costumes behind because they were being pursued by creditors because, you know, it was such a disaster. I mean, triumphant season artistically, but no one was that interested because they'd been, you know, built up to this idea of an evening of dance being three short works. And um, mm. so it, it is interesting. In the early years of the Royal Ballet, I mean, um, they also did a lot of new work and a lot of, you know, one act pieces and it was only Nanette de Valois in sort of perseverance that she kept coming back to the those narrative story ballets and I think she really re rebuilt the resurgence for those um, those works and so now I think uh, you know we, we did a survey about you know indicators of or into why people come to the ballet what's a thing that brings them and and um, I think Sharon's right 82% uh, of our audience come for the music um, so I think the musical scores are something, and I think mm -hmm. Tchaikovsky made a huge impact on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, we look at ballets now, and there's the pre-Tchaikovsky ballets <coughs> and the post-Tchaikovsky ballets, and the music in the post-Tchaikovsky ba ballets are so much better. Mm -hmm. And Nat, you've choreographed um, Rite of Spring. You talk about great disasters, David. When Rite of Spring was mm. first played, mm -hmm. um, the audience booed, and, um, mm. and you know Stravinsky had to go and hide for a while. Um, and it's now, you know, a much revered piece. But when you choreographed that, uh, Natalie choreographed the Rite of Spring for um, the National School in Hong Kong, and it was then taken by the, uh, the company, the professional company, and it then went to South Africa and a very successful work. But when you, when you chose that music, did you look back at previous versions? Um, when the music... When I chose the music, um, I started to research through the internet um, about the music itself, um, but I really tried to stay away from looking at other versions of the work because I thought um, that it was the music that should be the stimulus for what I created, not what had come before. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting that that <coughs> whole idea of ritual and all of those things that were done in the previous works were so entrenched in the music that, that, that the work I did also involved very much a sense of, of ritual. But it was truly, I think, the, the power of the music that was most exciting. And Stravinsky to interpret is um, extremely difficult because it's so complex. But it was quite an amazing accomplishment, I felt, by the end of it to have interpreted that and and to have that drama underneath the dance su and supported so beautifully. Um, so th that, that was because it was written for, for mm. dance. Mm. Mm. I think it's interesting too, because a lot of the, <coughs> the works we think of as great classics now actually were terribly reviewed when they were... I mean, Nutcracker was seen as a complete waste of time. Um, in fact, Ch Tchaikovsky was absolutely devastated because, you know, mm. and he didn't really want to take the commission because... Um, the, the story, they, the version they chose to do was the French version, which was all very sugary. And he wanted to do the very much more sort of Germanic... Gutsy. Yeah, gutsy version. Mm. And Swan Lake was just a disaster. I mean, it was, it was actually shelved and never seen for 30 years until Tchaikovsky died. Mm. Um, and Sleeping Beauty was, you know, they thought it was too symphonic. So it is interesting how all of these ballets that we think of now as, you know, the great masterworks, <coughs> actually at the time, were cutting edge. They were, you know, mm. too avant-garde, too new, too, you mm. know. Mm. So, Shea, what, what do we understand that, you know, you read different phrases about, um, about the way people have worked with the classics. You hear recreating, reimagining, restaging, <laughs> remounting works, uh, such and such a version after someone. <coughs> I mean, what... what Help us with yeah, what all that's okay. about. Okay, I think you know there are a couple of things. When, and correct me if no, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> if I'm it's sure. ever wrong. <laughs> um, I think there are a couple of things. One is that when we talk about these ballets, they're actually cultural objects. Mm. I think, and I think that's why they remain popular. So even though there might be, you know, some people might call them heritage ballets, and that would be one way of thinking about them, or the classics. They're actually cultural objects, and people remount these um, versions with a faithfulness to the, as close to the original as they may have known, so of a time past. So that, that's giving respect to that cultural object and respect to the choreographer perhaps initially, although we all know that that's changed slightly mm. through time, but there's a nod to that anyway. Um, and, and that's a fairly straightforward um, concept opposed to the reimagining of the ballet in a new context for our time. Mm. 
which is what a number of the, the, the newer chore choreographers of, of new versions of the classics will, will attempt to do. Um, and, and that becomes a very different scenario. Uh, I think that whilst the person remounting the cultural object, the heritage version, is trying to be very true to the original, but there's an amount of creativity there. They have to research, mm. as Nat said, but they have to research what it was, research what's written about it, re research through the dancers who remember the work and the companies that hold um, licences to the work, if, mm. if that's the case, and try and find out what they can to be true. You come to somebody who wants to make a new version of the work and it actually asks more questions than, than gives answers as to why they would be doing a new Swan Lake or a new... Romeo and Juliet, or a new something else that we already know and respect as a cultural object. So you have to look to, to the context that these new, newer works are, are looking to be made in. So the context is that it's of our time. So what is it that they're going to do with these ballets? How much respect do they pay to the original? And how much do they innovate and bring in a newness to a version of a story that we know? And knowing how much of that adaptation from an, an original is there, how much is innovation, it makes it a very um, debatable issue mm. as to how and, and why these works are or are not successful. And the, I think part of it is the faithfulness that a choreographer has to the original in some way, a sense of fidelity, um, the loyalty to what the original idea was. And if it's not to the original idea in some form that an audience will recognise, then what is it they're doing and why are they doing it like that? And then the questions become, how do we understand it? Are they trying to bring in a, a broader audience, a bigger audience, to a known story in some, case, in some, in some way? Uh, are they trying to be, the choreographer trying to be challenged by the power of those old works? We all know that Romeo and Juliet, Swan Lake, they're powerful works. Mm. They might not have been initially, mm. but, no, but, but they've they become established yep. as such. And, and that power is, is what draws people to it. And choreographers will want to challenge themselves against the power of those older works. So the notion of innovation is then all dressed in how successful is the reimagining of that work and why have they done it in that particular way. Mm. Mm. Now, Nat, you've recreated the <coughs> classics. You've done R&J, um, your recent work, Carmen, and um, so, so talk about how you, th you know, the process that you go through when you start that. Yeah, I mean, I guess I see, as a choreographer of today, I see it sort of as a, a duty in a way to try to mm. not only reimagine um, what's defined as a classic mm. or a master work like Carmen or Petrushka mm. or Orpheus, uh, mm. pieces like that. Um, it, I think as a choreographer of today, it's important to also try to create uh, what will become the new classics of the future. And I mean, there's a lot of choreographers working with the big ballet companies who do that. And I see it as a very important part of, of what we do. But um, what I try to do if I'm, if I'm taking a what's known as a classic, like an RNJ or a Carmen, is um, find what it is within that story that is attractive and, and why has it lasted. Um, for example, for RNJ, it's, it's so timeless because it's about love and loss and um, just fate and things that are very, very human and very, very real. And so that's what brings me to, to want to recreate those sorts of works, is that sort of humanity that... Um, through cycle of life never changes. It's, it's sort of the one constant thing and what makes us all, all very real. Um, and I think storytelling is very, very important for dance and contemporary dance in particular, I think, has, is, is usually more known as an abstract art, art form. But, um, you know, the success of classical ballet, because of its storytelling, I find it interesting to try to bring that into a contemporary way because we <coughs> want the people to come along and understand what it is we're dancing about, yet still feel like we're pushing boundaries and, mm. and finding new emotional connections to people. Mm. And, and in response, I think that the way, Nat, you do that is actually through the vocabulary of the dance, mm. which is not how the, the, yeah. the story was furthered mm. yeah. in the old classics. Yeah. So it's a very, very more contemporary way of developing the story mm. through the vocabulary of the medium. Yeah, I think mm. um, certainly from, I know from a lot of the more contemporary choreographers, um, they tend to want to get rid of the mime altogether mm. um, <laughs> and to make the movement and the design and the power of the, 
of what d the art form of dance can say and by the way the art form of dance can touch people, that tells the story rather than having to kind of bring it back to a simplicity of mime. And it's, it's quite challenging but really beautiful mm. when it works. Mm. Mm. David, the Australian Ballet's done two versions of Swan Lake in the last ten years. Ten years. Yeah. Um, some might say that's overkill. <laughs> Gilding um, the lily a little. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk us through? Uh, Graham Murphy did the first, and Stephen yeah. Baines uh, the, the version last year. Yeah. Just talk us through how it is that you know that those decisions come. And it sort of feeds back also to what Sharon was saying. Um, we always knew that Graham Murphy's production of Swan Lake was going to be a radical rethink only just because of his history. I mean, that's mm. what he's always done. Um, and he is a choreographer who also loves telling stories. Mm. Um, and he, the first thing he did for us in that vein, I guess, was the Nutcracker, which he took the idea of Nutcracker, um, you know, about this whole idea of really coming into um, maturity. That's what I believe the Nutcracker mm. story is about. It's young Clara who, you know, is leaving that world of being a child and, and growing up to become a young woman and falling in love. And so he took that idea and made it into an older woman's journey and looking back. Mm. Um, and also, you know, telling the story about <coughs> Australian uh, ballet in Australia, the birth of it. Um, when, he, when he did that, I actually said to him, the last season we did in 99 when I was still dancing, I said, you know, have you ever thought of doing something like that to another ballet? And he said, oh, I love you. I'd love to do a Swan Lake. <laughs> and that was the thing that actually stuck in my head when I was appointed and I thought Swan Lake was the first ballet the company did. It was our 40th anniversary. You know, let's see if, you know, Murphy would be interested. And he did. Um, and, you know, interestingly, he actually went through a, a very long process of coming to the idea that he ended up coming to because he researched a lot about the original ballet and it was done in Moscow and it was um, these two ballerinas that were actually vying for the role and one of them got it and the other one was the Tsar's favourite or the, you know, she was quite, you know, senior in the sort of, you know, whole cultural world. And so he had this whole thing in Rasputin and, you know, it was all getting very confusing. And he and Christian and Janet got to a point where they're like, I know, look, I just don't think we can pull all that together to make something that makes sense. And then they turned on the television, there was a documentary about Diana. And um, they all sat there and went, oh my God, this is the story. It's about a prince who falls in love with a beautiful woman, but then there's another woman in his life and she has a meltdown and then they started dreaming about this and that's when they came up with the idea. So when they presented it, he did this funny thing where he said, you know, oh, well, we get, we've got two productions for you. One's with this sort of owl who's got a daughter who obviously comes from Western Australia because she's a black swan, and, uh, <laughs> but he's not an owl and he, he turns into a, you know, and, and then there's a prince who loves chasing after birds because he must be some sort of, you know, bestiality. And I was like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> So that's not the version we're going to do. So um, tell me about the version that we are going to do. And, um, and he said, you know, he started the story. On the eve of the wedding, there's a beautiful young princess named Odette. And on the eve of her wedding, she finds out that her, her prince is actually in love with someone else. And I went, this sounds like Diana. And he's like, mm, could be. And then, you know, then bringing in all the, the, the ideas of her, her madness that sends her to the, to the, you know, she's on the sanatorium and there's this beautiful lake with swans and she dreams and, and transforms herself in her mind into a swan. And it just touched all the right areas. And look, you know, I said to the board when we started the production, I said, this is either going to be one of the biggest successes the company's ever had or I'm going to be the shortest living artistic <laughs> director. And, um, and they sort of went with me. I mean, I guess they thought, well, they took a risk on giving a principal dance of the job. We may as well see if he's <laughs> going to actually deliver anything. And, um, and it turned out, luckily, to be, you know, a, a great work. But it was a reimagining, and that's why, ten years later, you know, we had a generation of dancers in the company now who have only done <coughs> the Murphy Swan Lake, mm. and I really mm. wanted to have a production where, you know, we had a black swan who did 32 fuetes and, you know, and there was that, that illusion of a traditional version. And I thought Stephen Baines, because of his background, but also because of his, you know, his pedigree, I guess, he, he is a classical choreographer. Mm. He's unashamedly a choreographer who likes working in classical ballet. And so um, he, you know, we talked about it and he also was very keen to do that. And then, um, he really wanted to keep the cap time capsule of the second act as... as true to what he thought as, you know, original. And he actually really based it very heavily on the Mariinsky production, which was mm. the 1890-whatever production, which has, you know, been handed down through generations. And actually, funnily enough, 
extremely different to the old version that we used to call traditional, which was Anne mm. Williams' production, which was actually very, very different. So, you know, this whole idea mm. of original is quite, you know, mm. troubled anyway. Um, but it, it, as, as Sharon was saying, it, it really conjures the illusion of a much more traditional version. Mm. And the interesting thing is, too, that I believe, I mean, you know, you look at through the ages, I mean, from the 1800s, um, through to contemporary time, the technique has changed so vastly. I mean, you, you look at the original pictures with the ladies with you know rather large legs and sort of you know bosomy, and you look at the mm -hmm. girls now who are completely not that shape. And even in you know the the Bolshoi, I mean, the dancers are completely different shape to what they would have been mm. when that ballet was Absolutely. created. So yeah. you know, I think they morph and change with the technical development mm. as well. Cher, as a critic, what are the what are the aspects of of a new version? <coughs> that you look for to determine the success or otherwise? Mm. <laughs> I, I suppose at the end of the day, I look at it and hope, or I look for gaining more from the new version than I have lost from the old. So mm. what, what have the payoffs been? Mm. Um, how, how is the questioning how it, what's the integrity of the questioning? Because, I mean, we, we can talk about new, new versions of classics that have worked, but there have been a lot that haven't. Oh, yeah. That people We've done some. go... <laughs> <laughs> but people will go and see, and they might say, how does that connect to the original? I just don't get it. Or it doesn't make sense. Why does that happen there and then that happens there? It doesn't make sense. So the, the whole idea of the innovations and the newness doesn't add anything to what we know about mm. the original story yeah. in any way, shape or form. So it becomes more confusing than satisfying for mm. an audience. So I guess that that's the major thing. And I, and I look for the integrity of the work um, and the, the respect um, of the choreographer to the original work. What respect they have for the original in some way, mm. and and it's 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 very hard to talk about it in the abstract because each choreographer's version is very different. You mm. know, it, it, none of them are the same. But but I think it's I think at the end of the day, have have I gained more from seeing this new version of the work than I have lost from the old? From mm. the old, mm. yeah. I've just forgotten my question to now. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come back to me. I know what it was. Um, You've created works on both ballet dancers and contemporary dancers. I mean, these days there are a lot of dancers who can turn Cross their hand over. to both and, mm -hmm. and, and, and there's more crossover. But I guess you do have the big traditional ballet companies and uh, you're one of the rare choreographers that's been invited in to work in those environments. So is it easier to tell a story with, classical, with, with ballet technique or, or not? Or do you find it easier to construct a narrative with contemporary tra trained dancers? Um, I think in, if, you, if you'd asked me a few years ago, I probably would have said um, it is easier to create a narrative within a, within a ballet company, uh, I guess because the dancers are trained to tell stories predominantly. It's, it's probably 80% mm. of the works mm. that the ballet companies do are story ballet, so that they're trained in that way. Um, and I remember always approaching a ballet company with what I said before, trying to make the movement tell the story and within that beautiful ta classical technique and genre, um, create new movement but using that fabulous facility that they have. And so most of the works I did for, for ballet companies probably did have a, a narrative. Um, however, now being director of a small contemporary dance company, um, I, I feel like I'm doing the same thing except I approach the work again very, very differently because I'm so interested in telling stories and, and also playing with the classics in a, in a smaller way. Um, so once again, it's just pushing the movement. Um, and when a dancer knows a choreographer really well, I think that's, that's mm. what I found, what I was looking for into coming to a company of my own. When a dancer knows the choreographer, um, the work is created so much more easily and, and the essence of telling stories is so much easier because the choreographer has a history with that dancer. <laughs> so I guess it changes, mm. yeah. Mm. And, and, and I think, like I said before, um, it's, it's so rare that a lot of contemporary companies don't really tackle storytelling. They're, they're much more happier in a more abstract or, um, yeah, sort of a more abstract physical sense. Um, whereas I'm finding myself once again drawn back into that storytelling because I think it's very, very powerful um, and trying to find new ways to do that. 
think, sorry. No, you I was, I, Because I, I actually think there is no such thing as an abstract ballet, because even the most abstract mm. ballets mm. have some sort have of themes something themes that yeah. draws, you know, it's, mm. I mean, probably Balanchine got the closest mm. when, you know, someone said to him, what's your ballet about? And he said, 28 minutes. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 he, he was probably one of the few that actually it was all just, but then, you know, he also said, if you give me two dancers on stage, you have a relationship. If you give me three dancers on stage, you've got a story. Mm. So, you know, he did, um, mm. he did sort of even with mm. that. But the other thing that's really interesting too is I actually think there is a bit of a, a turn back, uh, not turn back, but um, a change. I mean, uh, Wayne McGregor just did Raven Girl in mm. the Royal Ballet, mm. which is, you know, based on a story that was written, you know, in the vein of a children's story, actually, mm. almost a fairy tale type vein. So I think there is a, a desire for people to mm. do storytelling. I think mm. that sort of postmodern, um, you know, it's all just about the movement thing is actually sort of Starting dying. Starting to change, yeah. yeah. And, and, and in a sense, that it's all about the movement was part of what was shifting the culture of dance across mm. the world, really, in, in investigating something new. And, and nothing new comes about from repeating with reverence the old mm. Mm. only. In order to find something new, people have to experiment. They have to try things out, and they do at times have to fail mm. um, in order to f for the form to move forward. Mm. So we wouldn't be where we are now mm. and able to talk about new versions had some of that play and investigation and research into movement in and of itself not happened. Mm. We wouldn't be where we are now. So it was a necessity Absolutely. in a sense. I mean, you know, we always talk about the, uh, the you know, um, Diaghilev period as being this mm. incredible genius of time where, you know, everything was so new and exciting and brilliant. I mean, there was a lot of terrible, terrible, terrible mm. ballets that never kept, you know, going. I mean, we only mm. have those ones that were brilliant mm. and I think at the same with the classical period I'm sure there's a whole lot of those yeah. big hoary classical ballets that no one would <laughs> ever want to see again because they were terrible mm. you know and the I ones that survive th are good yeah. I think there's a real return nowadays that people are really searching for meaning again mm. so they're looking uh, and, and they're within the works they're looking for themes and meaning and and the power of all of that to tell something that is very real that people can go home and feel moved and touched by and I think that's Exciting that oh, yeah. we've kind mm. of come Absolutely. to this place. And it's in our whole age with advertising and everything. I, I mean, they'll tell you, what's the story? You want to advertise something, what's the story? Mm. And deviate. Lloyd talks about the fact that we're living in an age people want stories. Mm. Mm. But what, I mean, <coughs> ballet's been fantastic for fairy tales. Mm. And that's part of its mystique and its otherworldliness. And yeah. um, but is it really challenged as an art form in terms of telling contemporary complex stories or are you just going to stick to the fairy tales? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a really interesting article that I actually read. Um, it was given to me by a friend. It's something, it was a, a really very strong article about you know, ballet companies, get your head out of the nursery. You know, really get into the, you know, the way of being more provocative. And I think there, were, there was a period in the 1970s, and I think you know, it was Ashton Macmillan, that actually went towards that more literary storytelling. Mm. And you know, uh, Manon Lescaut is a great story about, a, you know, once again about a woman who you know, loses a weight. It always seems to be the girl has to <laughs> die in the end for a ballet. Um, or be married, one of the two. Um, it's very... <laughs> Live happily ever after. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. No one ever sort of, you know, the guy never dies and the woman, you know, lives <laughs> happily ever after by herself. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it is, I think, there was a period where, you know, there were some of these the literary ballets that were sort of quite fantastic and, and, you know, great choreographers doing great work. But I think, quite honestly and, you know, provocatively, I think ballet companies get lazy. I think, you know, mm. we are so driven by getting so many people in the house and, you know, and we're so driven by what we have to achieve at the box office that, you know, of course you're going to put Nutcracker on because you will have a full house. Whereas if you put on, you know, a new work about, you know, some gritty tale about some poor person who, you know, didn't have a great time, then not so uplifting. Mm. I think one, one of the other things too is that, that there are great stories of, of humanity, mm. you know, great themes, love, death tragedies you know Shakespeare hooked into that with storytelling and these classics in, mm. in a sense have done the same thing so the thematic drivers remain the same in a sense you know but the, it, again it comes back to context you know if you if we live in Israel and if we have to survive in that political climate 
Is one way you survive by escaping to see a classic? Or do you go to the theatre and want to see a work that's going to help you connect with the trauma of the country in which you live? So I, I think that, you know, audiences, which is a really broad word, but, but require different things at different times, mm -hmm. you know? The, the arts, as, you know, have an, a, a great function to help us understand the world we live in. Mm. And it can be argued, as you, you're saying, and you're provocatively saying we're still in the nursery, some of the classics, perhaps people say, don't do that. Mm. You know, don't help us connect um, other than through those large themes. So, but I, I, I agree, it's very difficult. What is the new work mm. that could become classic that does help us connect with the world in which we live and make it um, a more understandable place? Mm. And it's not, it's not only an issue for dance. I, I mean, mm. you know, in recent years, the film industries said, where are the scripts? Where are the mm. Australian stories? Um, you There's know, a to big help resurgence in fairy stories in film. In film mm. Yeah. Mm. But if you unravel those, st those stories, there is always a deep, dark, underlying meaning. Mm. And they're actually quite mm. ferocious and scary, especially some mm. of the Grimm's Tales. Yeah, so yeah the Grimm's Tales, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> but it's interesting, like yeah. yesterday I had a you know, great day, I loved it. I went to see Mother Courage at the um, Playhouse. And, um, and there we are looking at a classic play, Bertolt Brecht, told through an indigenous mm. you know, thing and looking, and really quite at the end of it, I mean, I was in tears. It was just such the most beautiful performance. Mm. And also as, a, you know, as an Anglo-Australian, you know, I felt, wow, you know, I, you know, this, it, it was really powerful you know, as an indigenous you know, f thing. And that, you know, I, f I, I felt driven to you know, make the world better. <laughs> um, and then I went and saw La Bayadere in the evening, which was absolutely amazing. But it was Corsair. the complete... Like Corsair. Oh, sorry, Corsair. <laughs> Wrong ballet. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't see Bayadere. Um, maybe, in, maybe in your dreams you saw yeah, That's I the saw end of the day. That was, was all those tutus. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was exactly. all those tutus. It was after I had the opium after uh, Corsair. <laughs> no. But, um, but it, was, it was a very different experience, but equally as... Uplifting because you know you left the theatre going oh my god that was so beautiful you know mm. and and exotic and so otherworldly and those dancers were just so beautiful and so you know it is interesting how you can get a very different reaction from seeing different styles mm. of theatre I guess mm. just just talk for a little minute about um, the ways these ballets are preserved you, you said before it's not a perfect science I mean dance does have a form of mm. um, of recording that's written called notation, but very few people um, can read it, unlike music, a musical score. Mm. Um, so, so what are the ways that the... I mean, obviously now we have video, but mm. video doesn't always no. show you all of the and detail. It's amazing how, with video recording, how if someone makes a mistake, mm. that mistake can become <laughs> yes. the, the repertoire. The, the yeah. captured <laughs> moment of truth. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, yeah. And interestingly, you know, choreology really is relatively new in that, you know, there was Laban and the Benesh, mm. but really of this 20th century. And, um, and so there were various notations which, you know, mm. have happened over the years, which now a lot of people can't understand mm. because it was written in such a way mm. that's been lost. So, I mean, <coughs> most of these works have been handed down from generation to generation, and it is from teachers, dancers who were, you know, mm. in the original cast, handing it down to the next one, coaching and mm. that sort of process. And, and in a way, I mean, that's why I think that whole idea of original is quite sketchy yeah. when you're looking at some of these works. Very much so, mm. yeah. And then you've yeah. got people like, you know, Mill Millicent Hodson, I think, who recreated the Rite of Spring, the original Rite of Spring, from photographs and, and written material, which mm. you sort of like go, well, mm. is that really a recreation <coughs> or is it actually a, you know, a reimagining yeah. of what yeah. she's read about? And, and I think also that, you know, as David's alluded to, it, it, as soon as you have a written word and you shift it from, from one period of time to another, the meaning changes. Mm. So, you know, the love and notation can be consistent. It could be consistent over 50 years with little tweaks and developments, but alongside love and notation, there is also a, a written text about how to interpret the notation. Oh, so there are two lines of information mm. with it. 
um, and they had to put the text in because people interpreted the steps and the score differently. Mm. So there's another layer of information in, in, that written te in, the, in the written form too. But of course, you know, 50 years ago, people will understand things in a very different mm. way. Mm. And that's why now when you have a notator do a ballet, like, you know, we often get, you know, if it's a new work to us, you know, the notator will come out and set the mm. ballet. But you always have to bring the artistic component as well because it doesn't, it's not on the page, no. you know, it is actually... Very hard to capture the, the memory on yeah, the page. and the experience. So someone can say, yes, that's the right step, but you need to do more, you know, yes, this sort this of way. movement with yep. it. And so, you know, there still needs <coughs> to be an interpretation. Mm. Ballet could have developed quite differently in this country. I remember as a, as a young student of dance, we had um, performances by Makarova and Baryshnikov uh, who had defected and there was sort of great excitement around these young dancers that de defected from the then Soviet Union. Um, but I remember a, a teacher who came out at the time, Jürgen Schneider, who I think was Baryshnikov's teacher. Mm. And I happened to meet him years later in the, in the cafe at the Australian Ballet and, you know, I said how... Um, I remember he said to me once as a dancer, he said, oh, I stayed up all night wondering if you would point your feet. And of course I believed him. <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't, but anyway, um, I'll never forget that. And I, and up, I said, so how... probably up all night, but not thinking <laughs> not, about yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, not, not thinking about my feet. But he said, thank God for Australia, because he said they didn't want me here. He couldn't find work in Australia. And he said, I became a millionaire in America. Mm. Um, but there, so there was something at the time about us, Australia rejecting really... Uh, Russian teachers. Mm. Um, maybe that's because, you know, obviously the roots of the Australian Ballet were with the, the English, mm. but it also had to do with the political environment at the time. I mean, you know, that was the Cold War. Um, the world's enemy was communism and, you know, the phrases like mm. reds under the bed and all of those sorts of things. So we kept out mm. the Russians. But it's interesting now when you look at training methods because the Australian Ballet School um, talks about the fact that they use the Vaganova method, which is the Russian training method. Mm. So Jürgen Schneider wasn't invited to stay, but now 30 years later, that's yeah. the preferred technique. I think, look, you know, I think you look at uh, when Jürgen would have been out here, would have been, what, the late 60s, early 70s? I, mid 70s, yeah. yeah. And we were fairly intolerant of anyone that was were different. I mean, you know, mm. and all of our um, information, I guess, about dance really came. Mm. I mean, even I was a kid learning ballet in the 70s, and the books that my parents used to buy me were Princess Tina ballet books that had Jackie Tallis t showing you the five yeah. positions of feet yeah. and all the pictures of the Royal Ballet. Yeah. So we were very <coughs> anglicised. Yeah. And, um, and the Russians were exotic and people, I mean, Edgley's made a lot of money bringing mm -hmm. Russian ballet companies to Australia mm. because, you know, they were exotic and we wanted to see them, but we didn't necessarily want foreign people teaching us how to be, you know, foreign to us. Yeah. And I think also we didn't, I don't, it's my understanding, I don't think we had large Russian communities um, of immigrants here in the mm. same way that they did in mm. America. Um, mm. I, so, you know, perhaps the, the place for, the, for a Russian insertion was not as easy in our country. But interestingly, I mean, the Russians were the ones that actually did build ballet in Australia. Yeah. I mean, you know, the Borobansky Ballet Russe, or, you know, it's yeah. Borobansky, it was... Um, um, uh, in Sydney, the, that famous woman, can't remember her um. name there, um, and <laughs> Kira Busloff in Perth. Um, but, you know, they were the ones that stayed behind and set up companies and, mm -hmm. and, um, and they did, you know, that we were actually, we, we have a ballet, co you know, culture in Australia because of the Russians. Mm. Well, mm. you and I were both taught by mm. Yanina Chinova and Marina Berezovsky yeah. um, and, you know, two fantastic teachers, but they never really felt... Um, completely accepted no. in, in Australia. I remember they used to say they talk of us, they talk about us as the bloody Russians. <laughs> the bloody Russians, yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you know, in, interestingly, um, <coughs> uh, they were sort of seen as, I mean, Anne Williams saw, said something that I thought was really interesting once too. You know, she said, you only really listen to people teaching ballet if they've got a foreign accent. And I do remember, <laughs> I do remember the things that Madame um, Chernova would say yeah. still, like in, even now when I'm teaching, you know, I said, you, why you look like that? Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> but, but, you know, she st sits in my head a lot more than a lot of other teachers that yeah, I had yeah. that, you know, that weren't quite as exotic. Mm. <laughs> David could could do many more um, impersonations. <laughs> <laughs>
But that's yeah. probably a, a, an up late conversation yeah. Yeah. <laughs> after about three glasses of wine. Yeah. Um, I've got thousands more questions, but we probably we probably should right. see whether our mm -hmm. audience has some questions to ask of our panel. Um, there's some folk here who have got microphones. There's so some raving mic. Please feel free to Could we bring some ask any questions. Down on us or up on the audience? Yeah. Oh, there's a question. There's a question right in the middle. Sorry, can you just wait for the... It's just that it's being um, recorded, filmed and we mm. all need to hear the question. Thank you. With your apologies, I'm from good old Sydney town, so I've just been to see G. Oh, which right. supposedly has something to do with Giselle. Mm. And a few of us had no idea what the connection really was. Could you better explain it for me or do you actually feel that... Did you see it? Did yeah, see this it? is Gary Stewart's work mm. called It was G. incredible. I mean, everyone mm. applauded towards the end. I mean, it was just... Very well taken, but um, I couldn't see it as ballet. I need well, explanation. I think you're absolutely right. It's definitely... I don't think he wanted to do a ballet. Um, he's done a, a, a number of works based on other works. Another piece he did called Bird Brain, which was um, based very loosely on <coughs> Swan Lake. And I think Gary has this great um, sort of interest. He actually trained as a ballet dancer. He mm. trained at the Australian Ballet School. And he loved um, that, that whole idea of, you know, the narrative of, you know, dance. Um, but he is a very contemporary choreographer and he loves sort of skewing that whole idea and, and giving it a completely different, you know, take. So I think, you know, Giselle was his absolute jumping off point, but I don't think there's anything within um, G that relates at all really mm. to Giselle. Um, even, <coughs> even the fact, I mean, but, but, but I love the fact that he actually was so interested in that work to create something from it. I so thought he was interested <coughs> in think some of the bigger themes, madness mm. and love mm. and just yeah. more, more generic themes rather than... Yeah, and also the complicated narrative, you know, that Lars is actually Albrecht and, you know, that he's related to Batilda and, you know, it was... I mean, you know, sometimes when you look at some of those stories, they are actually quite, mm. you know, mm. nonsensical in a way. Or not nonsensical, but, you know, incredibly complicated. They're not linear. No. I, I think they're not linear. And, and he would be one of those choreographers who would look at a classic and we'd say subverts the content in some way. His choice is to subvert rather than appropriate from. Mm. So that's been his artistic choice to do that. Mm. And, and it's great that he's not called it Giselle. Mm. You know, he has called it something else. He's let you know it's Giselle because there's a reference somewhere to it. Mm. But it's not called Giselle, so... You know. And then you've got someone like um, Matzek, whose Giselle mm. is actually much more literally follows mm. the story, but completely yeah. in Turns a very different way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's, there's a hand there. in Wonderland that I saw the Royal Ballet Company perform. Um, I wonder if one of you can, or any of you, can tell me about what you thought about the balance between mime, or you may say pantomime, and classical dance. So, I don't know if everyone heard that, but um, the, the question was about Alice in Wonderland and the, the use of mime slash pantomime. I think, I mean, I've only seen it on <coughs> DVD. Have you seen no, Alice in Wonderland? No, I haven't seen, not that Yeah, version, it's, no. it's a really interesting production. It's by Christopher Wielden. It's a completely new score by Joby Talbot and a beautiful design. Uh, we do a lot of projection, um, and I can't remember the... Crowley, Bob Crowley. And um, it, it really is looking... It's, it's in the structure of a classic narrative, all the mm. things you talked about. It's a three-act structure. It's... Um, it's very, you know, based on the Lewis Carroll story, but it's, you know, it's, the music is absolutely fantastic, really very danceable, contemporary, classical music. Um, and he's really followed that narrative. And, and I think drawing on, because of his English heritage, but also because he's worked a lot in New York City Ballet, um, that sense of pantomime, which I think Ashton also drew on for his Cinderella, and a lot of English choreographers have used that idea of pantomime to tell, you know, story and bring comic elements to it. Um, but he's done it in such a way, using so much of the technology of today and also the technique of the dancers and some of the vocabulary, which is really quite 
contemporary in its, you know, in, down the contemporary end of classical ballet. Um, and he's really produced this amazingly successful work, which is, and interestingly, he's tweaked it a couple of times since he actually premiered it. So now he's put an extra interval in, he's made it, you know, a little bit more um, shorter. He's really structured down some of the, the storytelling. And it's, it's really interesting to mm -hmm. see a contemporary <coughs> choreographer of today, classical choreographer of today, um, doing a new, what we would probably call classic, um, mm. and being really successful mm. at it. Mm. Do you think the amount of mime and the amount of classical ballet is balanced? Well, I think choreographers today try not to do mime, actually. I think they try to actually, a bit what Natalie was saying about, you know, using using the language. So there's very little of you here, why anymore. Mm. It's really more like you, you know, and they'll, they'll do something that actually says that, but it's actually more in a dance vocabulary. Mm. And I think, and I, I think that started with Ashton as well and Macmillan and Cranko. I think, you know, for us these days, a lot of that mime as such just doesn't really cut it. And it was really interesting mm, to watch course, last yeah. night. Mm. And, you know, it was mm. interesting that you had that because mm. I was watching it being, you know, what I think of as, you know, sort of fairly um, up with ballet mime. And it, even I was like going, wow, this is really complicated. You know, mm. all the this and the, you know. And, yeah. the, and yeah. I was like going, if you had no idea of any of that gesture, yeah. you would be a little bit lost. And there were long passages mm. Mm. of it. So mm. you could be and totally lost. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the, gest the gesture is, if, you know, can look at it and see it as being quite interruptive to the lyricism of the dance. Mm. So it would depend on the choreographer's desire as to how they wanted to actually structure the storytelling, as to whether they wanted moments of interruption and, and to interrupt the dancing to do the miming in order to get back into the dancing again. So it's how they choose to, to map it out. Um, dynamically. And I find the interesting thing too is that it actually challenges the dancers both ways. To do the mime is really challenging to make it make sense for an audience. And, you know, I remember doing the mime in Giselle and going, mm. wow, you know, it's really hard to make that look as if you, if you didn't know what it was to actually have a, a meaning behind Makes it. Sense, but yeah. equally, it's equally as hard not to have that mime and progress the story. Yeah. So it really, you, you have to, as, an, as a dancer, really act you know, and it's really, it's, it's mime in the sense of Marcel Marceau as opposed to you hear, dance, yeah. you know, go. Mm. And I, I think another thing that, that, that choreographers today have are the tools of the trade that are very different to 50, 100 mm. years ago even. And, and I'm thinking of Stephen and just the use, simple use of projection with the bird. Yeah. Um, but bringing in other resonances of, of, um, and references that help us to understand what some someone is talking about through the movement. Mm. So they signal other things for us. It might not be literal in the same way that a mime does, but it will be referencing other things. So we as an audience are doing work to pull together these references mm. and resonances of other things to make meaning with it. Mm. And, and choreographers will spend a lot of time figuring out how to do that costume set projection, sound, mm -hmm. numbers of people in the space, mm -hmm. all of those sorts of things. And there's a lot more at our fingertips mm -hmm. these days to make work from than yeah. choreographers well, of the I original classics. I remember when we did Sleeping Beauty and Maynard Gilgood said, then but one. <laughs> it's in the okay. Lilac Fairy Mime. Then but one. And I don't know uh, what, how that changes all of that. And you know, the handsome prince which kiss and, I mean, that's fairly obvious. And then but one. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you have to be in that club. You need to know <laughs> what that means. <laughs> do, 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 do. There was a, there was a up question. Up the back here. Up the back. Um, Sharon, what you said before about the new adaptations, um, where you want to see whether you gain more than you lose, mm -hmm. what do you think of a choreographer like Matthew Bourne, who pretty much seems exclusively to reimagine things? Because I adore his Swan Lake, but... Yeah. Since then, any Swan Lake I've watched has seemed a bit meh. Because I just, I don't, the power of the men was so strong for me that I watch the girls now and I'm like, yeah, I don't, yeah, I'll just go watch this one when I get home. <laughs> <laughs> so, what do you think about his kind of adaptations? Because he seems to be exclusively I, yeah. almost. I, I think, you know, for, for him, he was questioning the, the gender roles in ballet, mm. you know, obviously. Um, why do swans always have to be female? It, it's got longer neck. 
<laughs> I mean, typically men have more feather hair. No, anyway. <laughs> um, I, I, I mean, I would look at them both within the context of, of how they're being presented and, and not necessarily have a preference for one or the other. Mm. Um, as, as a critic, I suppose, one of the... One of the one of the things is that I don't often go to the theatre and have a pleasurable evening. <laughs> um, because, not because works aren't pleasurable, but because I'm thinking about them all the time. Mm. So I'm, all the time when I look at work, I'm, th there's, there's a questioning process going on. So I, I, I try to let my senses understand what I'm seeing, feel, uh, seeing and feeling. Um, but my, my mind is, is, intellectually querying everything along the way. So I, I never have a preset idea that I'm going to see one thing that is going to be superior to another or better than another or I'm going to like more than another. Um, I rarely come out of things and really say whether I like it or not because that's actually a bit irrelevant, I think, as a critic. Um, I try to look for the context and the success of the work within the context and I think Matthew Bourne is equally successful in what he set out to do in, in his Swan Lake version, as is Stephen, as in as is Graham, as in a traditional classic, you know, they all have something very different to offer, and they all question the the narrative content of Swan Lake in some way. It's just Stephen really does it in a much much more in your face way because it, you cannot sit back and think I'm going to get a lovely fairy story Matthew. and I love the music and thank you very much I know what's going to go Matthew. on and I'm going to like it you know so yeah. sorry David I was just wondering sorry I think that David I was just wondering your process of actually when you determine your program for coming years what is the process you go through I mean is it easier to take the classic and get somebody like Graham to redo it or if you decided to stage Manon or Ghost Dances or mm. something that hasn't been around for a long time, is it easy for you to say, right, that's what I'm going to do? And, or um, is there a, a I guess, you know, when you put a program process. together, for me, I, I tend to think of the program as running for the whole year um, because, you know, we do a number of works in different places. And so, I mean, for instance, the program that we bring back to Queensland next year, I want to be quite different to Swan Lake because, you know, if we just keep bringing back versions of Swan Lake, then after a while people go like, oh, well, I think we've seen that. Um, so, you know, you try to, to um, put in the program, you know, things that are going to uh, show different sides of what we do. Um, in the, the arc of what we do for, you know, I, I, we do the most programs in Melbourne and Sydney, um, there is always a bit of a formula. Like, you know, I do like to do a 19th century classic, um, a 20th century story ballet, classic sort of thing, <laughs> um, a, a contemporary mixed program. So if they're not new works, they'll be, you know, newer of, you know, the last 50 years. And then um, a program of more classical mixed program. So, um, so you know, you bring, you know, something like a Sweet on Blanc and a Balanchine Tutu Ballet and something like that. So, you know, there is a bit of an arc across, because ballet is such a great palette. I mean, there is mm. so much of it. I mean, from, Many things. you know, fr right from La Sulfide, you know, the, really the most original and authentic ballet which has been handed down from Bourneville, and I think it is probably the most authentic mm. classic there mm. is, through to, you know, things that have been created today. So, you know, we do actually have quite a spectrum to choose from, and um, so I try and sort of touch a bit of all of that. I was thinking, is it like a copyright thing? So that if oh, you chose yeah, something no, like yeah, it's it's tricky. Man. Yeah, yeah, it's it's there's a whole lot of paperwork that goes through. Like the Balanchine <laughs> Trust have their trust, and you have to get the authenticated Balanchine people to come. As with the Killians, as with the Ashtons, as with the Macmillans, all of those you know choreographers that we know of. It's it, there's a whole process that you have to go and through. And it'd be budget too. Huge budget considerations and um, and that's why you know if if we were going for a cheap year we would have all new commission works um, not that it would be cheap to build but they're much easier to mm. commission someone than it is to actually get the rights to do other people's works and the more famous the works the more expensive they are so yeah but it's fun <laughs> <laughs> we're probably out oh, of I think there's a question one more? at the back there 
Sorry, I was just going to ask, you know, you were talking about old traditions and new tricks. I was just wondering, you were speaking a little bit about Indigenous Australian ballets and um, do you consider the old traditions from the Australian old tradition dancing and to actually to bring it in a new way and joining it in the old traditional way? I mean, I know it's a very um, controversial kind of subject in, in, in uh, crossing these kind of old traditions together because they're very different. But what's your opinion on being able to do that in um, combining, combining Indigenous dance, old traditions of com um, traditional Australian dance with old traditions of Russian or imperial or, or, um, or ballet, uh, French ballet? We, I mean, I can only speak, I guess, about our company. Um, and we've had the great privilege of doing a number of networks now with the Bangara Dance Theatre, um, who are, you know, our indigenous dance company. And they, I mean, they draw on 30,000 years of culture to create work. And, um, and Stephen Page, their <coughs> choreographer, but also um, Francis Rings and uh, Daniel... Um, Riley. Riley. Um, and um, McKim also... Um, McKinley. McKinley, that's right. Francis Rings. Yeah, Francis Rings, and, and also um, lovely Elma, Elma Chris. Um, mm. So, you know, they, they actually do that. They, they draw on their Indigenous culture and use contemporary dance as a medium to, you know, to do that. Um, we've done a Rite of Spring with Bangara, which was fantastic. And, I mean, you know, one of the most emotional times, I think, was in 1997 um, when we all sat around in a big circle and, you know, half of the circle were the Bangara dancers and half were the ballet dancers. And for many of those dancers, it was the first time that they'd actually been sitting there looking at an, you know, an Aboriginal person. So it was, a, you know, it was a big meeting of both of our tribes, so to speak. And we, um, we have then, you know, built this incredible affection for each other and great respect. And, and so we've done a number of works using um, Bangara dancers and, you know, choreographed by Stephen. And I think it's a uniquely Australian thing, and I'm really proud of the fact I love those works. And, and you know, we've gone overseas several times and taken Bangara with us, and we've done these amazing seasons with them. And, um, and I think, you know, as Australians, you know, it's, we, we should be... There's so much to learn from our Indigenous culture, and, and I feel like, you know, we, we have so much to learn. And, you know, the, the more that we can actually... Um, integrate into their world as opposed to them integrating into our world, I think we'd be a lot better off. Mm. Mm. Um, the conversations can continue out in um, what's been dubbed the ballet bar because there are sort of hanging tutus and point shoes <laughs> yeah. and, uh, in the front of the theatre. Um, can I thank you all for your attendance today and can you join with me in thanking our three speakers?